a lot of people, isn't it? It's, it's, it's only a few of us, but um, I feel like it's going to be a perpetual struggle, um, at least for a while, to, to have people coming at 10.45. But nonetheless, it's time, so let's ask God to bless us, and let's begin our service together. Loving God, we ask that you would pour out the spirit of your grace and your love upon us as you gather us for worship. Deliver us from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and let's lift up our voices in song to God. Good morning, church. As we sing this morning, let us all look to Jesus and what he has done. Let us praise him with all our hearts and all our voices, giving thanks to our God. Let's sing. There's a light before me And it drives away my fear In the silence there's a voice that calls me And it tells me you are Grace, I will set my mind 
on the things of God. You have won my heart with your everlasting love. I will follow you. I will walk by faith. You have brought me by your unrelenting grace. I will set my mind on the things above. You have won my heart with your everlasting Sing your praise, oh Lord, oh 
This life I live is not my own For my Redeemer paid the price He took it to be His alone To be His treasure and His prize The things of earth I leave behind To live in worship of my King Is this the right to rule my life? Mine is the joy to live for Him coming from next door, which is not usual for us, uh, may be a bit distracting, but nonetheless, uh, let's worship our God, and at this time, let's bow our heads, let's ask for forgiveness as we pray prayers of confession. Let's pray together. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offences against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and in forgetting your love. And God, we humbly pray that you would have mercy on us, for we are ashamed and we're sorry for all that we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and to walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Would you each receive these words, which assure us of God's grace to us? We remember with great joy and wonder that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, we each have been healed. And so as people who have been healed of our sin, people who have been forgiven, let's stand and let's sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. time and then the Bible reading will be from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 to 12. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today as your church, help us to recognize first and foremost that we are sinners and that we fall short of your glory. The wages of sin is death, a punishment we unmistakably deserve. And as we reflect on this truth, I pray that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ may shine ever so brightly. That Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God and have eternal life with him. Lord, so often we gravitate towards the things of this world and find more worth in perishable things. We ground our identities in our careers and we at times participate in the world's race to chase after a wealthy, healthy, and comfortable lifestyle at the expense of holiness, Lord. Help us to count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing you, our Lord and Savior. I pray that each and every one of us here today may live a life that honors you. Lord, I also pray that our church may swiftly and smoothly transition into the PCA. I pray that you provide wisdom to the leaders of our church as they faithfully navigate through this transition period. I also lift up a prayer for the face-to-face -face church service transition that has taken place. It may be uncomfortable for those who have gotten used to worshipping in the convenience of their own homes. So I pray that you help us to remember the vows we made as members of SLHCC in regards to how we will serve and dedicate ourselves in building up the church by serving each other. Although it may be difficult to a predominantly introverted church, would you spur us on to connect intentionally? Finally, Lord, as a church, help us not to forget to pray for our pastors, Pastor Steve, 
Mike and Paul. The shepherds of our church need the prayers of their sheep as much as they need his prayers. Help us to remember that they are also one of Christ's sheep and are susceptible to the same weaknesses as us. I pray that you give them spiritual protection, boldness and power to preach the gospel, wisdom and understanding. I pray in particular for Pastor Steve as he will be delivering your message today. Would you use him as your mouthpiece to share your gospel with unwavering conviction? I lift all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. The Bible reading today is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Hear God's word. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is the word of God. We'll dismiss the children, and if the children could follow the, um, the teachers out to their various ministries. And as we do that, let's turn to each other and greet each other. God bless you. It's good to see you. Um, uh, and I suspect that there's quite a few kids missing today, looking at, looking at um, the, the families who aren't here. And so, so please be praying for them. If you, if you do notice who's, who's not here, I, I did get a message from quite a few of the families that their children are sick. So, so please reach out to them and connect with them. But we're going through uh, 1 Peter, and we're looking at this passage, and I hope this passage, as, as we consider this, would be a great blessing, a great comfort to each one of you. Let's bow our heads. Let's ask God to bless us. Loving God, as we look to your word, have your spirit work amongst us. Have your spirit so work so that we would rest in you, and in that rest, that we would be comforted. In that rest, we would be encouraged. And Lord, as we look to this word, as, as it is unpacked before us, help us to see its truth. And would we not just acknowledge that to be true, but would we hold it deep in our hearts and remind ourselves of it and live by it for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when we Christians encounter suffering, the temptation is that, that we lose perspective. And so we begin to complain. We complain about the things that are actually not as bad as they first appear to us. Now, because we're the ones that su are suffering, and because that suffering looms large in our sight, and because that suffering is often difficult, you know, with tears in our eyes, those tears can often distort the perspective with which we should look at all things. And so, we Christians, when we encounter suffering, we often lose perspective. Now, Peter here, in, in, this, in this letter, he's writing to fellow believers who are undergoing suffering for their faith. But as Peter addresses them, he, he acknowledges that they're suffering. He, he acknowledges the difficulty that they're going through. But as, as they go through that, it's noticeable that Peter doesn't actually offer pity. It's not like he comes alongside and, they, and he goes, oh, cheer up. It's not so much that. Rather, he points us to that which we should never lose sight of. Now, often, when we suffer, we tend to just look down and we wallow in self-pity. You know, woe is me. No one has it tough as me. No one has it as difficult as me. But what Peter is doing in this, in this book is, yes, suffering is real, and yes, suffering does happen, but look up and see what is really there. Now, we become so absorbed in the pain of our lives that we lose perspective, the perspective that we're meant to have, that God is using even our suffering. God is using even your suffering, yes, for his glory, but also for, he, for your genuine good. And so if you remember, for those of you who were here last week, 
as we looked at verses 6 to 9, um, within wig, right? What you see is not what you get. For us as Christians, what you see is not what you get. And the reason is because of verses 3 to 5. In verses 3 to 5, we're shown that we have a new identity, a new reality in Christ. And that new identity means that we've been born again into a living hope, a living hope that can never fade, that can never be lost, that will not perish, that is surely, truly yours. Because of that living hope, God, as he leads us in life, is surely leading us to glory, surely leading us to goodness. And part of that may be that we go through hardships and suffering, but that suffering is not for nothing. That suffering is not random. That suffering is not coincidence. That suffering, even that suffering, is for our good. We will actually see the good of that when we look back. Now, as we consider uh, verses 10 to 12 this morning, what the Apostle Peter wants us to do now is he wants us to take a step back He wants us to take a step back and consider our salvation. Now, if you trust in the Lord Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, then salvation is surely yours. It is definitely, without fail, yours, and it can never be taken away. But that salvation which is yours, what Peter is urging us to do now, is to take a step back and to look at that salvation and see just how awesome it is, how great it is, how amazing it is. And as we see just how beautiful and how blessed we are in that salvation, Peter is urging us, God is urging us, to live with a deep sense of joy, a deep sense of gratitude, a deep sense of privilege. And all that, that joy, that gratitude, that privilege, stemming from a deep realization of just how amazing, how wonderful our salvation truly is. And this is important because you know, if we're honest, if we're all honest, it's true, right? We don't always, we can all confess that we're not always grateful. We're not always grateful. We don't look at life thankfully. And so what God teaches us in this passage is very, very important because he's saying, look at the salvation which is surely yours and see it from an objective standpoint, not just simply as something that, is, that you have and therefore you can so readily take it for granted, but look at it from an objective standpoint and see just how amazing that salvation truly is. Now the reason that Peter does this, the reason that this is done in this passage is because from from next week's section, as we look at the rest of 1 Peter, what Peter actually does is, because we're Christians living in this world, in the midst of suffering, and yet called to be Christians who remain committed and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks about how we ought to live, the attitude, the things that we ought to do in our lives. So, So we'll look at it next week, but look at verse 13. If you have your Bibles open, look at verse 13 and see how it starts. Look at how verse 13 starts. It starts with the word, therefore. Therefore. What's being done is, now Peter's Peter's transitioning, this letter is transitioning in, in teaching us how we ought to live. But what Peter is doing is, you ought to live this way because, throwing back to what we've covered in verses 3 and 5, 6, 6 to 9, and 10 to 11. Throwing back to those things, because of those three things, your identity in the living hope that is yours. Because God is even working for the, through the bad things for your genuine good. And now, keeping sight the reality of the, the wondrous salvation which is ours. Therefore, live this way. That's what Peter is doing. And so the passage that we're looking at urges us to see our salvation with renewed wonder, with renewed amazement. That literally, all was done for you. Everything was done for you. Now, at this point, generally speaking, when we, th- when we live as Christians today, we shouldn't think from an individualistic standpoint. It's not just about me. We're saved and we're brought into a community. 
But at this point, when we realize that all this was done for you, it's not you, plural. Think of it as you in the sense of me, individually. All this was done for me. And three things that this passage goes through. The scriptures were given for you. Ministries were given for you. And then finally, all was given for you. And so those three things, scripture, ministries, all was given for you. So look, let's look at that first one. The scriptures were given for you. The scriptures are given for you. Look at verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11, we read these words. Concerning this salvation, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. And what this is talking about is a salvation that is ours, but Peter's actually talking about the salvation which is ours, described in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures. So Peter is he's here painting for us a picture of the writers of the Old Testament. Now those writers, as they were writing the Old Testament, they weren't just recording random facts. They weren't just recording ceremonial requirements. They weren't just recording judgment on Israel. But actually, what Peter is showing and, and what the Bible is saying is that those Old Testament texts were actually pointing to Jesus. And that Old Testament writers realized and understood that what they were writing about was a salvation that is in Jesus alone. And so these authors, they were amazed. They were gripped by the marvelous message that the Spirit of God was revealing to them. The marvelous message that at some point the Messiah would come. At some point God would send his son. At some point Jesus would save his people. And those writers whom God was inspiring and working through to write the Old Testament scriptures, they were captivated by this salvation. They were captivated by this salvation which would surely come in Jesus. They were captivated so much that they wanted to know more. They wanted to understand the times and the manner and how this was all going to come about. And so it says that they searched and inquired carefully, inquir inquiring what person or time. They wanted to understand more. And so they gave themselves to the diligent search, the diligent study of scriptures. They compared one scripture passage with another. They discussed it. They talked about it. They debated it. They wanted desperately to understand God's word a little bit more. A little bit more. Now, when we consider that this is how the actual people God used to write the Old Testament scriptures, how, this is how they felt about the words that God was directing them to write. The challenge that that presents is, is that how we feel about God's word? Is that how we feel, how you feel about God's word? Now, as I was pre preparing this sermon, as I reflected on my own self as well, no, I think it's safe to say that I probably look to God's word more in terms of time and more in terms of quantity than members of the church. But as I reflected on this, that the writers of scripture they were amazed and that they were gripped and that they searched and they diligently inquired of what the scriptures meant. I felt personally a sting of rebuke because Peter is painting a picture of, of, of a diligent searching that these writers of the Old Testament scriptures made, trying to understand as much as they could about all that would come with the appearance of Jesus. And yet these were people who did not yet enjoy the fullness of grace that I do. These were people that did not yet have the full picture of the person and the work of Jesus that I do. They did not fully understand what God would do, but I do. 
And yet, here they are, diligently searching Scripture. It's a point of stinging rebuke. And surely for us, isn't it a point of stinging rebuke there as well? Compare, compare what the writers of Scripture did with us. Now here we are, here we are, on this side of Calvary, on this side of the empty tomb. And we know intimately, and we know personally the name of Jesus. We know his words. We know his work. We are believers in Christ and we enjoy the benefits of his death and his resurrection. We've been united to him by faith. In fact, the spirit of Christ dwells in us. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So we have all of these benefits, all of these privileges, which, let me be blunt, they, they, these benefits that the least of us have are far greater than anything enjoyed by the greatest of the Old Testament heroes. The greatest of the Old Testament heroes, they only had a minuscule amount of understanding and goodness and realisation that we do. And yet for many of us, the Bible, God's word, so often largely remains shut, unexplored, marginalized. It's a rebuke to us. Now, our appetite for the message of Scripture is dulled by the junk food of constant entertainment and empty pleasures of this world. But do you know what the fallout of that is? Do you feel dissatisfied? Do you feel uncomfortable? Do you feel directionless? Well, it's because, it's because that comfort, direction, purpose for us as human beings can only be found in God. And yet we're looking for it elsewhere. And so, when we don't look to Scripture and we rather gorge ourselves on the junk of empty pleasures and entertainment in this world. We miss out on so much comfort, so much direction that only God's word can give to us. In fact, we harm our own hearts and we harm our own lives by the neglect of God's word. <clears throat> so the diligent search of these Old Testament writers who longed to know the Christ that the Spirit was showing to them is a rebuke to us since we have so much more than they did. We ought to search diligently and in, in eagerly and enjoy the blessings that our Saviour has purchased for us that is offered in Scripture. But in thinking about this, why is it? Why is it that we sometimes don't go to God's Word? And I was thinking about this, and I think one of the, one of the reasons that many people would give, one of the excuses that many people would give is, well, when I read God's Word, I want to, I want to read God's Word, but when I read it, I don't really get it. I don't really understand what's going on. I really don't see the point, especially the Old Testament. Especially the Old Testament. But if that's you, I want you to hear what Peter is saying because if you see the principle that Peter lays out, if you see the key that Peter presents for us, that helps to unlock what, the, what, what Scripture is getting at and helps us to see the beauty of Scripture rather than simply merely the words on the page. So, Peter, if you were to ask Peter the question, who wrote the Old Testament, do you know what he would say? It's in verse 11. Now, we would think that he's going to say, those men in the Old Testament times, they wrote the Old Testament scriptures. And that's true. God worked through them. They did genuinely write it. But, look at verse 11. It was the Spirit of Christ. It was God himself, the Holy Spirit, who wrote the Old Testament by the prophets. And then if you were to ask Peter a second question, a follow-up question, what is the message of the Old Testament? That is answered again in verse 11. So verse 11, it says the, the Old Testament is about the sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glories. The sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glories. To summarize that phrase even more, what's the Old Testament about? The best, one of the best perfect Sunday school answers? 
Jesus. The Old Testament is about Jesus. And it's not just a, 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 an easy, you know, fling away kind of answer, throw away kind of answer. That is the point of the Old Testament. You see, the struggle that we have is that when we read the Old Testament, sometimes we can't work out why that obscure ceremonial law is there. Like, why do I have to wash this way? Why, why is that instruction given? Like, animal offerings? When's the last time I did that? What, what, how do I see that connecting anywhere? Or you read these historically minor geopol geopolitical events that may be historically true, but seem to have no relevance to me in my life in 2021. And we l read those things and we go, what's the point, God? Okay, it's, it could be good for general knowledge, it could be good if I'm, you know, if, it's, if this is a random question that comes up in, in a tr game of trivia, but to what end? But Peter's point is this. The whole of the Bible from beginning to end and all of the Old Testament is actually recording history, recording events, recording ceremonies, recording prophecy, recording poetry, all to point to what God would do in Jesus Christ. The Bible is written by the Holy Spirit to point to Jesus and all that he has done and all that he will do for us. So the whole of the Bible speaks of Jesus and the salvation that he will give to us. And I want us to see just how amazing that is. See, when you think of salvation, sometimes we can think of salvation simply being accomplished at the point in history when Jesus came and died on the cross. And at one level, that is true. At one level, that is true. But because God is never thwarted and never frustrated in his plans, and his plans are from eternity past and never changes, his plan that he would send his son at some point in history and that he would die on the cross as payment for your sin and mine, that is a reflection of his eternal plan from eternity past which means that your salvation, my salvation, our salvation is not just at the point of Jesus' crucifixion, but it's actually from the be before the beginning of time. It's from eternity past. And from then, that is when God had you in mind. And all that he revealed through his servants who wrote the Old Testament was so that you would see that Jesus would come and accomplish that. So, for in the page, so, so the pages of Scripture, every page, every page was given for you. For every page of Scripture speaks of Jesus and what Jesus would accomplish for you. So the first point, the Scriptures. The Scriptures are given for you. You personally, individually. Secondly, ministries are given for you. Now, if you continue reading, this passage says something else which is extraordinary, extraordinary. Look at verse 12, start of verse 12. It was revealed to them. In other words, the salvation that would be in Jesus was revealed to the Old Testament writers. That's what's being meant. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Not themselves, but you. In other words, God raised up those prophets of the Old Testament so that through their ministry, you would have this book, the Scriptures, that so clearly witness to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means the ministry of all those men who wrote Old Testament Scripture. Moses, David, Samuel, the Chronicler, all the prophets, major and minor, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12 minor prophets that we went through in our series, every single one of them, their ministry in a very real way was for you. You as an individual. God directed them so that their ministry would be for you. They were raised up and they ministered so that, that, so that you would have the scriptures that reveal the Lord Jesus Christ, reveals his grace, reveals his deity, reveals his plan. So that your faith 
could be sure in the truth of Scripture. Then going on in verse 12, Verse 12 continues on and says, in the, things that have been, that, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. Now the word preached here is, not, is a very, very general sense use. It's not, it's not a narrow use of the word preaching that, that a minister or a pastor would do in a service. But it's the idea of gospel proclamation. It's about sharing, declaring truth. And so this is about everyone Anyone who has ever declared the gospel truth, anyone or everyone who has shared the gospel truth with you. Now cast your mind back to your, to, to your life, in your life. And some of them, you may not even be able to remember their faces. And definitely you won't be able to remember all of their names. But if you were born into a Christian family, that doesn't mean that you're a Christian, but if you're born into a Christian family and you've, got, you've attended church from your earliest memories, the teacher who took you in Sunday school and shared the gospel with you, whether that be creche, children's ministry, youth group. If you went to school and you attended scripture classes, that person, that volunteer who came into school and shared the gospel with you, your parents, who may have shown what gospel living was in their devotion to the Lord, in their reading of Scripture, in their personal praying, in their direction to you of what Christians ought to be and ought to believe. Your parents may have been the ones. So every single one of those people, your friends, me, some other pastor, now your, your parents, your friends, the scripture teacher at school, the Sunday school teacher at church, your pastors, every single one of them, God actually raised up so that their ministry, which is, yes, genuinely done for God, but that ministry that they did was for the sake of you, for the sake of you hearing the gospel, you hearing the truth, you being pointed to Christ and being saved. Now that alone, those two things alone, is astounding. That all ministries, the ministries of the writers of Scripture and the ministries of every single person who you were involved with at some level as they shared the gospel with you, every single one of them, their ministry was for you. That's astounding in and of itself, but that's not where it ends. Look at what verse 12 goes on to say. Who, who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. What this means is that not only those men who wrote scripture, not only those people, some of whom you, don't, you can even barely remember who ministered to you and shared the gospel with you, not only those but God himself ministers to you to bring you salvation. God himself ministers to you and his ministry is given to you. You see, when, you hear, when someone hears the word of God, it's not the persuasive words of the preacher or the sharer and it's not the good intent of the listener does transformational work. The effectiveness of the gospel preached and the way that it takes root in your heart, in our hearts, is based on the work of the Holy Spirit. It's based on the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not just through the prophets that the Spirit of God worked to give us the blessing of the Word of God. It's the Spirit of God who now propels that Word of God through the mouths of human beings who carry it. And it's the Spirit of God who opens the hearts of people so that they are able to hear the truth and embrace that truth. So what we've been given in this passage is it's for you. Scripture, it's for you. And ministries, it's for you as well. And then finally, all, all is given for you. So look at that final phrase that we see in verse 12. 
Um, things into which angels long to look. Things into angel into which angels long to look. Now, for us, um, we don't know, like. I can't recall a time where I've preached just on angels, and there's there's a, a, an area of study called angelology, and and there there is these things. But but you know, we're not a church that's focused too much on it, fixated too much on angels, and and that's not necessar- necessarily a bad thing. But here, the focus is on angels. And the meaning here, when, when it says that, that phrase, long to look, the meaning there is, is, is the idea of peering in from the outside, longing to be a part of that group. Right? Peering in from the outside, longing to be a part of that group. It's almost like this. I mean, uh, 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 an example that we could sort of understand, relate with is this. So you're really, really hungry and you're waiting for your friend because you're meant to meet and you're meant to go out for dinner but they're delayed. And so you're getting hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And you know, the phrase is you, became, you become hangry, right? You become hangry. But your friend finally makes it, and so you go to your restaurant and you both order. But you know, as, it, as it's usually the case, their food comes out first. Their food comes out first. And so you sit there waiting for your food and their food's out first. And you don't want to be mean, you, don't, you want to be nice, and so you tell them, just go ahead, your food's going to go cold, eat first. And so, you're hangry, but your food's not out, their food's out, and they're eating in front of you. And you watch with intent focus as the food goes from the plate, with, through the spoon or the fork, whatever else, into their mouth. And they may say, oh, do you want some? And it's like, no, it's right, <laughs> it's right, right? You, you know that feeling, right? That, that wishful, I wish I had some of that sort of that attitude. That's what we're dealing with here with the angels. When it says, when it says that things into which angels long to look, it's that I wish I had some of that attitude. And, we're, and, and what the Bible is saying is that the angels have that about us. Why is that? Well, we need to understand angels. Angels are powerful servants of God. More powerful than us, stronger, more knowledgeable, more capable. They go out and accomplish what God intends. And yet, the angels, with all their strength, the angels with all their strength don't get an important thing that you and I do. So much so that the posture of the angels is they look longingly from the outside thinking, I wish I had some of that. The angels are servants, but the angels are not the ones for whom God has given all. We are the ones whom God has given all. I mean, the angels, think about the angels. Think about, and, and just try and go from their perspective so that we can get a sense of that, I wish I had some of that attitude. Now, the angels, they'd been there at every point of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The angels were there thrilled as the Father's plan and the prophetic word of Scripture was being unfolded as God inspired men to write Scripture in the Old Testament. And the angels, they were astonished as they saw the eternal son, their Lord, their maker, humbling himself and taking on flesh and be joined to human nature in the womb of the virgin. And then the angels, they were there as they announced with wonder and delight the pregnancy of Mary. And then when Jesus was born, the angels were there and they split the skies with their joyous song at their birth, at the birth of the Savior. The angels, they marveled to see the lawgiver himself, Jesus, learning to submit to that law and suffering as a human being as he grew. And then the angels were there at the climax of Jesus' sufferings, at the height of his agonies on the cross as darkness covered the earth. And the angels heard Jesus cry out, it is finished, as he breathed his last. 
and then the angels. They were there when the stone was rolled away on that first Easter Sunday morning. And they there witnessed the eternal son who'd risen from the dead, risen from the dead, and now brought life and immortality to life. And then finally, when Jesus ascended into glory, and the disciples, the, the disciples stood dumbfounded, like a slack jawed, staring up into the heavens. The angels were there rebuking the disciples, reminding that Jesus would return just as Christ had gone. At every point of Jesus' ministry, everything that Jesus did, the angels bore witness to the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but, even as they knew what Jesus was doing, and even as they saw what Jesus was doing, and even as they understood what Jesus was doing, at no point were they the objects of what Jesus was doing. At no point were they the recipients of all of Jesus' actions. It was not for the angels that Jesus came. It was not for them that Jesus is, the one, is one day returning. It's all for you. It's all for you. Jesus came for you. He bled for you. He rose and he reigns for you. And he's coming back for you. That's why the angels see this glorious giving of God himself to humanity. And they peer in longingly with, a, I wish I had some of that. It's as if they're asking themselves, what must it be like to be the recipient of such a love, such a mercy, such a grace? It's not that they don't understand what love is. It's not that they don't know what it means, but their knowledge is only as a spectator. They haven't tasted the goodness of it. They haven't experienced the warmth and the pleasure and the joy of it. They don't know what it is to have sins forgiven. They don't know what it is to be adopted as a child of God. No, they don't know what it is to have the spirit of Christ dwell in their hearts. And they don't know what it is to stumble and fall and yet be met with a patient and holy God who by his grace picks us up from the dust, empowers us and urges us lovingly to press on and persevere until we cross the finish line. The angels, the angels do not know what that's like. But if you are saved, you do. You do. And so the angels look on, even the least of us, with, dare I say it, a sense of jealousy. They see us struggling to understand the Bible. They see us often stumbling, so prone to wandering away from the Lord that we say that we love. And yet they're amazed because even the least of us knows firsthand what they could never, ever know. You and I, despite our frailty, despite our brokenness, despite our weakness, despite our sin, because of God's great love placed upon us, not because of any worth in me or you, but placed upon us because of God's good pleasure from eternity past, we taste pardoning mercy. We taste and enjoy adopting love. We are beneficiaries of the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus that washes us clean. And we have fellowship with the living God such that we can call him Father. Father. The angels, who are more powerful than any of us, see this and they look on longingly. Because what they see is that everything, all, was given for you. All was given for you. So what does this mean for us? Now this passage, as I said, was given to us 
so that we can maintain proper perspective, even in the face of tough suffering. God is encouraging us to take a step back and consider how awesome, how great, how marvelous, how amazing this salvation which is ours truly is. How amazing is it? How great is it? Well, Scripture, which speaks of our salvation in Jesus from beginning to end, was given for you. Ministries which declare the immeasurable love and mercy of God in Christ are given for you. Scripture, ministries, in fact, Jesus himself is given for you. What that means is all, everything is given for you. And so let us, let us live with a deep sense of joy a deep sense of gratitude, a deep sense of privilege, not forcing it out of ourselves, but looking to the salvation which is truly yours. The salvation which is from eternity past. The salvation which is accomplished by God himself. The salvation which is applied to you by the Spirit himself. The salvation which angels look on longingly for. Let's live with a deep sense of joy and deep sense of gratitude and deep sense of privilege about that salvation. Let's see our salvation with renewed wonder and renewed amazement because all of it, all of it was done for you. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you, in your great love, has given us, have given us this great love and mercy and blessing. We seek your forgiveness for those times when we forget just how great it is and instead we get waylaid, we get distracted, we digress with minor quibbles that we have in our lives. That's not to say that suffering isn't real, that's not to say that hardships aren't genuinely difficult. But help us to see that we are a people in you with a hope that can never be extinguished. Help us to see that we are a people who, even through those very hardships, you're working for our good. And help us to see just how extraordinary a salvation we have been given in your son Jesus. So as we see these things, by your grace, help us to stand steadfast. Help us to stand committed to you and help us to walk the life that you have set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in our worship as we um, give our offerings to God and let's sing as we do so. Father, we thank you that you've sustained us and kept us this past week. Now, as we um, spend this time in worship, help us to be reminded once more of your great grace to us, not only through the worship that we are called to, but through all of our lives which are meant to be lived for you. Lord, as you provide in the myriad of ways that you do, help us to see that all those things come from your hands and create in us ever more thankful hearts, thankful hearts which want to bless you 
thankful hearts, we want to praise you. And Lord, as we give these gifts, use it to deepen our faith, to, to mature us all the more, and to strengthen this, our church. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me to the, the back of the bulletin. We'll go through the church notices together. But before we do so, um, before, before the first, if I could just remind everybody, what time, well, uh, it's a kind of a question. What time does service start? 10.45, 10.45. Please come by 10.45. At 10.45 this morning, we had, um, we had eight, people, eight people in here. And, and so, so and, and um, four of them... <laughs> are up here. So, 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 so please, uh, please come by 10.45 so that we can um, s- s- begin our service sharp at 10.45. Uh, I know it's, it's going to take a bit of a while because we need to adjust and we're, we're so used to you know, just um, turning on the TV or the computer and, and joining online. But now that we have to come and some of us with, with kids, it's not always easy. But I do want to remind you, 10.45, so please aim to get here by about 10.40. 1040. Uh, the first, first announcement point there, if you, if you see that QR code, if you haven't already done so, then please do this. Now, if you've done it, then you don't need to do it again because you just add a double count of your vote. But um, if you haven't done so and you're a member of church, please scan that QR code and that'll take you to our website where you can uh, fill in the petition saying that you agree with our elders being reinstated as our new elders as, as part of the PCA. Um, if you haven't already done so, please do so. But if you have done it, please don't do it. So please um, take, take that step. At this point, if you could do that, that would be great. And some good news. Um, from this week, as you probably saw some people sort of heading out during the, during the offering, from this week, after the service, we have refreshments. Um, I'm not quite sure what those refreshments are, are or how... how how hearty or how big or how filling they may be. But nonetheless, we have refreshments. And so um, after the service, please stay back, join in those refreshments and light snacks, and they will be served um, from this Sunday onwards. Because that's the case, um, we will require more hands to assist with the cleaning team. Uh, The cleaning team at this point has basically been um, doing stuff on a fortnightly basis, but we need to go to a weekly thing. And because we do have the food stuff now, we need need more hands on deck to help with the clean up afterwards. So if you are a member of church, um, if you aren't involved in um, much by way of activities or or ministries within, within the church on a Sunday, and you are able to give of your time and effort, which I encourage you to do, Please come see me or go see DK, who's sitting up the front. He's, the, he's heading up the, the cleaning team. He's a team leader there. So please, if you could see us and, and put your name down, that would be very, very helpful. Um, the more, more volunteers, the easier it is to, to get things done. So please, if you could do that, that would be great. Also, this afternoon, we will have the Sunday Afternoon Fellowship meeting at 1.45 at church for sermon discussions. That time will probably change in future weeks because with the, um, with, this, with the refreshments and light snacks being served, that may mean that it may be more convenient to go straight into the SAF after that um, refreshment time and then after SAF is done, we can head out and have a late lunch or whatever else. But for today, for today it will be 1.45, so please keep that in mind. Now, the, the next rotation of the membership class was meant to commence today, but I, I, I want to start with everybody together um, who have registered, and some could not attend this week, and so it's been pushed back one, one week. So, so thank you for those who have registered, um, being, being generous to, to agree to that. But if, you're, if you've been attending and you haven't signed on for the, for the membership class but would like to do so, well, praise God, you have this one-week window. So, so please um, take, the, take advantage of that, and if you'd like to join, come see me. Uh, if I could have the next slide as well. Um, so this Wednesday, this Wednesday during Philly Central, we'll be hosting Paul Beeston. Paul Beeston heads up the church liaison for Compassion, the group, the Mercy Ministry group. Um, and he, he, he's come before and he's preached for us before, but he'll be coming this Wednesday, not so much for Compassion, the organisation, but to speak on the topic of why gospel compassion matters why gospel compassion matters. So it's the idea of why mercy ministry is important 
for us as Christians. So it'll be this Wednesday. The Facebook event is up. If you're on Facebook, please click attending so that we can have a clear idea of numbers who will be present. It'll be, it'll be the first one in um, over a year where everything is done in person. You know, the, the, um, the Philly Central that we had in March last year where the speaker was here and everyone was here, that's the last one that we had all in person. All of them since have been some form of online. But this one with Paul Beeston will be the first one in person. And we need numbers. The reason being is, depending on the numbers, we'll either hold it in here or we'll set up tables outside. And so if you could click um, attending so that we have um, an indicator of numbers at present, that would be very, very helpful for us. Also, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share the, there's a short clip that's been prepared, and that, that'll, that's something that we'll share next week. But during the month of May, our Mercy Ministry team will be encouraging church members to go and donate blood. Um, so please um, follow the Facebook event. There's, there's links there. You need to, you need to register and, and choose an appointment time slot, and then you go. And the idea is you go, and as you're giving blood, you take a selfie and then send that picture through. And, I guess some sort of collage would be put together uh, of what's been done. But um, more information on that will be presented next week when we, when we have the clip shown as well. Now, if you could go, go to the community... Oh, one more important thing, sorry. Um, this coming Saturday, SMP is not on. This coming Saturday, M SMP is not on. Um, it, it's odd how often this occurs. Every now and again, because of weddings and so on, um, we, we've had to not hold a um, SMP. It's, it's uncanny how on that Saturday when SMP is not on, like, the person coming for the first time turns up. <laughs> so so uh, this Saturday, SMP is not on. Don't, don't, don't come to the door. Why is an SMP on? Well, you weren't listening then. But, um, SMP is not on. SMP is not on this week, but it will be on the following week, so join for that. Now, if you, in the community news, if you could be praying for Adrian and Sophia, who will be getting married this Friday. Um, they're getting married down in Barrel, and so, so there's um, a few, um, a significant portion of church moving down there to, to, to attend the wedding. So, so please be praying for that wedding and praying for them as they start married life together. Um, secondly, it's not in the community news uh, because um, in, in terms of external family members, um, we do limit what's, in, what's printed on the news to direct family members, so, so children or parents. Um, Children, parents, or siblings, that's it. But, um, but w w when we have um, extended family issues come up, we do make announcements. If you could be praying for Sujin, um, she heard news um, yesterday that her, her grandfather had passed away in Korea. Um, she's quite close with him, and obviously it's a difficult time. It's not something that she can just, current situation, it's not easy to just go. And so not being able to attend funerals, things of that nature would be difficult for her. So please um, be praying for her. If you do know her afterwards, just encourage her and, and maybe even just quickly pray for her as well. So if you could do that, that would be great. But that does cover everything, so I'd like to ask all of you to please stand. And would you receive the charge? <coughs> Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's sing the closing song to our God.
Loving God, we thank you for your infinite great love for us. That infinite great love and mercy that did all things so that we would be made right with you. We who, who could not accomplish even a tiny minuscule of that alone, you did it all from beginning to end, from eternity past to this very moment and until the end of days when you'll perfect us and see us and bring us to your very glory. And so as we remember that and as we see that, would it not just be a truth that we know, but would it be a truth that melts our hearts so that all the more we live in worship of you, we live in thanks to you, and we live to praise you. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen.